I think getting access to electronic components and things early on is very important. When you're just getting started out, you really don't have anything. You don't have tools, you don't have parts. And so you might have a bright idea, but then you have to think about what parts you need. You have to go and get them from somewhere. Parts was everything. Pretty much the only thing you could design was what you had in your junk box, what you could get at the local Dick Smith or uh, Tandy's or something like that. Well, having access to components when you first start is pretty crucial to, to get you past the starting point. This is not something you can do in theory. You need to be able to get a resistor or an IC or a servo motor or a potentiometer and, and stick it into a breadboard and put a multimeter on it and, and see, how, see how the voltage varies or how, how a certain input plate uh, produces a certain output. Occasionally you blow something up and you then have to uh, find out that you, you know, ran too much current through it and you, you learn from doing that and it's, you have, it's only by, by doing it you, you truly learn. It's important to have a, a small amount of components around. A lot of these still I've got from the 1980s when I was a kid. They're still my original component drawers and uh, I'm sure a lot of the components are a bit dodgy now but it's important to have a few basic jelly bean components available just so you can build things on the spot like that. It's quite important if you want to repair something, if you want to get something going again, you need to be able to source a part. It's crucial. If you can't get hold of the bits that are in published designs or even if you want to build your own designs, if you can't get those, well, it, the whole process is stymied. Yeah, getting components was difficult when you didn't have any money. I think anything's difficult. <laughs> As a young boy, the best source of components was old radios that people threw out. And unfortunately, they weren't new. They were pretty old. And there was 1920s, 1930s components that, that you would build things out of. And, and most people in those days didn't have a lot of money to spare. At the stage I was starting out, retail electronics shops did not exist. There was no such thing. I had no money when I was a kid, so I used to get bits and pieces, people would loan me or give me bits and pieces of radios, old valve radios, and I would make them into something. Well I think, funny enough, the first pilgrimages that you do make to get electronic parts or whatever is actually the garbage dump. I mean you're kind of like, oh we're going to the tip, great, let's go, you know. If you live near the garbage tip, you were right, because you could always go and pull all of the old bits out of things. You either had your disposals and surplus stores, or you had your local radio TV repairman who might sell you the odd brand new capacitor or brand new resistor if you were really desperately stuck and wanted to pay 50 times what you'd pay down at the junkyard. But we couldn't afford to buy components that cost that, and we built our stuff out of things that we could just scavenge off the tip. The main source of components was other people's rubbish. In Silicon Valley, there was a term called dumpster diving, where you'd hear about people like Steve Jobs and Wozniak going out the back of a Fairchild or Intel or wherever and looking in their dumpsters for our old circuit boards and, and parts. I had to go to the local tip, and I found that that was a fantastic source of bits. A mate of mine and I used to scavenge on the local tip where O'Donnell Griffin, which was a company back in the 60s that repaired television sets, used to throw a lot of their scrap uh, electronics out. As a young boy, the best source of components was old radios that people threw out. Colour TV was coming to Australia, everybody was tossing out their black and white TV sets. So on every roadside there were TVs to be had by the school to pick up and rat for components. I mean, you know those scrap days where they have you know, like televisions out the front of people's houses? I mean, you dive into that and just pull anything out of them you could in the time you had before the guy came out with his broom and chased you away, you know? But if you do like fixing things, you go around to council clean-up day and you've got enough to last 12 months. You'd find people throw out a TV set or an old stereo system and say, so you'd, you'd build a cart out and you'd throw the TV on the back of the cart and drag it home and start to strip it apart. That was, I think, actually how I got my first uh, serious electrical shock was pulling apart a TV that I'd scavenged. I look back on my days uh, as a scavenger uh, with a great deal of warmth. In fact, it's it's really what keeps Resurrection Radio running, the, those early years of scavenging. We'd come back with a billy cart loaded up with rubbish and we'd then go through that and with that basically free surplus equipment we'd build whatever we wanted to build. Sadly these days we do have dumpsters full of our old parts. If you go down to uh, recycling um, organisations, uh, if, if you recycle your stuff you can recycle computers and there's these massive dumpsters, the skips are full of, of old computers and I go, oh it'd just be fantastic to grab some of those but you're actually not allowed to. Nothing was thrown out in the, in the 60s. Nothing. You'll know the minute you throw something away, you'll need it tomorrow. To source the parts that you need, you have to look at the discarded pieces of electronic equipment that, that, 
may have been tipped or recycled or on the side of the road because you know, oh, that's got that capacitor or that's got that, that shaft or a, a volume control with a switch on it. I mean, that's a valuable piece for what we do and you can't really buy them. If I was a kid, I'd have a wonderful time just going around the, the suburbs at, at clean-up time collecting old VCRs and all sorts of technology. What's nice though if you work with a group of people is that you end up with, like, you have these overlapping collection of parts and you can you can share, someone says, oh, I need a, I need a this value resistor or I need a, this type of IC and you say, oh, yeah, we've got one, we've got one of those. Pulled things to pieces, so I was very good at uh, pulling things to pieces and reusing components. I desoldered the world, I had pots of like components of desoldering and eventually when I did do an electronics course in TAFE, you'd meet other guys, it's like, oh, here's my pots of components I've pulled apart. So everybody's just desoldering everything because you kind of learn how to solder. My main source of components was out of military gear. There was also um, electronic and, and electrical surplus stores, junk stores, there was a a major one in Cardigan Street, right near RMIT, which did a roaring trade, because of course all the electronic students were in there buying up all this vintage stuff. I used to go down and buy things that were just obsolete, or parts that had been stripped off computer circuit boards. And we had a lot of wartime disposal stuff. Disposal stores. Disposal stores. Disposal stores. Disposal stores. Disposal stores. Disposal stores. Some disposal stores used to sell radio parts, where all the old military equipment from the Second World War was being sold 10, 15 years later, and that's where you used to buy things. So you go down to Waltham's, and I remember buying little things, I've forgotten what they were now, but, but they were full of components. So you pulled these apart and you had a lifetime supply of all sorts of good stuff. Look, in the old days there was a lot more of that because there was a lot more junk around. When the war finished, of course Australia was at the peak of its production because we didn't know it was going to finish. We'd only perfected all the equipment and making all the equipment for our, for our troops overseas when the war finally came to a halt and they had this enormous amount of backlog of equipment here. They had huge stores, massive stores. That equipment was used by hams either as it was or they highly modified it. And a lot of the equipment in the museum here, if it hadn't been for the hams, this would have gone to the dump years ago. Aussie disposals, which had a lot of the military gear, uh, which was great. You could run down there and buy an old 1940s radio transceiver kit. Then you could buy the batteries for it and get the whole thing running and then be uh, pulled over by the police for having something looking suspicious on the side of the road. Some of it was not readily adaptable to any civilian use, so you could buy it for you know, virtually next to nothing, and you'd take the resistors and the capacitors and the valves out of that, and that, that was what you built your projects out of. It was a wonderful source of resistors and capacitors and all the stuff you couldn't afford. I mean, you know, you want pocket money, you didn't have a lot of money to spend, so a pound was a lot of money, but if you could buy a whole box of resistors and valves and you name it. I remember buying a, a, a lump of wire that had come out and it was, I think it was something like, it was, it was five kilometres of wire and I used that for years, cut it up and did all sorts of things with it. I built myself a noughts and crosses computer that would play noughts and crosses. It was not electronic, it was built out of telephone relays and uni selectors and I managed to get old rectifiers. They came from an old disposal store so I could convert the AC into DC. And I built a noughts and crosses computer in those days in the 1950s that could actually play noughts and crosses and you could never win against it. Echo, E-K-C-O, they made their TVs out of um, leftover parts from, from the war. They used the old resistors and, and things like that. They were good quality, they were reliable resistors and they used a lot of their componentry uh, from, the, from the leftover from the war because there's just a huge amount of it. You'd, you'd see something for a very modest amount of money and you'd buy it and take it home and you would uh, cannibalise it, you would dismantle it and get lots of goodies out of it. These days, of course, the military collectors would kill you for having done that because it, it was a beautiful collectible thing. But what you did, of course, is that you didn't charge yourself for your own labour. So you might spend 10 or 15 hours pulling it apart and lovingly cataloguing all of the parts that you got. So you regarded that as a bargain, but commercially that's just not possible.